Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar this afternoon about how and why journalists and civil society organizations work together. This session is a part of the ICFJ Pamela Howard Forum on Global Crisis Reporting and was organized in partnership with the Center for Cooperative Media at Montclair State University in New Jersey. My name is Aliza Applebaum, Senior Program Director at the International Center for Journalists, and I'll be your moderator today. Before I introduce our panelists and we get started, just a quick note to let you know that we welcome questions from the audience. If you have a general question or you'd like to direct it to a specific member of the panel, please go ahead and type it in the chat box or in the Q&A section below, which you should see a button for at the bottom of this Zoom. And I'll read those questions aloud when we get to the Q&A time. Um, you're also welcome to introduce yourselves in the chat so we can see where everyone is coming from today. Uh, now I'm delighted to welcome you to this panel discussion about cross-field collaboration between journalists and civil society based on a report published by the Center for Cooperative Media at Montclair State University in April. The report's authors defined cross-field collaboration as a partnership involving at least one journalism organization and one civil society organization in which they work together to produce content in the service of an explicit ideal or outcome, something that's very relevant for us here at ICF today. Our panelists for this discussion are Dr. Sarah Stonbelly, who received her PhD from New York University in 2015, and is now the research director at the Center for Cooperative Media in Montclair. As such, she designs, manages, and executes the research agenda, which supports the center's mission of growing and strengthening local collaborative journalism. She is also the lead researcher on this report. Pankaj Mishra is a career journalist with more than two decades of experience. He co-founded Factor Daily in 2016 to make sense of technology's impact on society with the depth it deserves. Pankaj is now rebuilding Factor Daily into a nonprofit media lab that goes beyond day-to-day -day stories for a needle-moving impact on society. And finally, Motunrayo Alaka is the executive director and CEO of the Wole Soninka Center for Investigative Journalism in Lagos, Nigeria. She has worked to expand the frontiers of social justice, democracy, and human rights in Nigeria, Africa, and beyond through the media for over 15 years. She currently leads the Collaborative Media Engagement for Development, Inclusivity, and Accountability Project, which supports media independence and accountability at the subnational levels of government with 26 media organizations. Thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to start with a question for Sarah, the lead researcher on the report. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the research and then maybe share some of the findings? Yes, I'd be happy to. And thank you, Eliza. Thank you, Aaron, Stella, and the rest of the team at ICFJ. Uh, we're so excited to be here today. I'm thrilled um, to be able to have this conversation with this excellent, uh, excellent panel. And thanks to everyone who's watching, everyone who's watching online. Uh, yes, I would love to discuss the research. I would love to sort of set the context for the conversation. Um, I did bring along a few slides. So maybe I'll share them now. Um, this panel, as Eliza said, is going to be discussing cross-field collaboration. Um, it is a newish uh, term. Sorry, one second while I get my slides up and running. And we're going to do this. Um, I would like to uh, give credit to my co-author, Hannah Shamashko, who could not be with us today, um, and direct you to the uh, website there if you would like to see the actual report and to uh, read more about cross-field collaboration in general. Um, so very briefly, um, as Elisa said, we released this uh, research in the spring. Um, we were commissioned by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to look at um, the collaboration between uh, journalism and civil society that we're seeing more and more of around the world. Um, so we really tried to just get our arms around this sort of uh, nascent trend. We looked uh, for two years at collaborations happening globally. Um, we spoke to 52 different people um, in both the journalism, on both the journalism sides and the civil society sides. And we ended up uh, just uh, defining this cross-field collaboration as a partnership involving at least one journalism, journalism organization and at least one civil society organization usually an advocacy organization, but not always, in which they work together to produce content in, the ser in service of an explicit ideal or outcome. Um, the civil society organizations we looked at included NGOs, included civic tech groups, universities, um, and the partnerships are deeper than, um, you know, funding or using, you know, sort of um, a source 
you know, a source journalist relationship. So this is really um, a step above that in terms of the collaborative element of it. Um, and with cross-border scope, uh, often these collaborations are cross-border, sophisticated visualization elements and detailed impact plans, some of the most important and impactful investigative journalism, as well as advocacy campaigns are now coming out of cross-field collaborations. Sorry. Um, in the research, we looked at 155 different cross-field collaborations. These projects um, were either based in or somehow involved 125 different countries on six continents. And the number of entities involved in these 155 projects was over 1,000, it was 1,010 entities. And increasingly, as we were doing the research, we recognized that we were really just scratching the surface. We were really happy with the breadth of our sample, but uh, we realized that you know the we just kept becoming aware of different projects, and we kept wanting to add them in. We had to sort of hold ourselves back and stop ourselves at a certain point. But um, I really do think that the even though we're happy with the 155, it's a good sample to sort of make generalizations on. We thought that really we could have kept going forever because there are so many um, new projects cropping up every day. Um, really quickly, the most common topics of the projects we looked at were governance and corruption climate and environment, and human rights, usually human rights abuses. Um, and the three drivers of the cross-field collaborations that we observed, um, number one, information producers, so journalism organizations, as well as civil society organizations, uh, are no longer able to rely on sort of the usual channels um, for getting their content out. Um, so by partnering uh, either with a journalism or with a civil society organization, um, you know, this content can take on different incarnations, you know, it can have a visual element, can have a tech element, um, and therefore have broader reach. So that was the first driver. Uh, the second thing, uh, the, research, uh, the resource constraints faced by newsrooms, which I'm sure um, so many people watching this are more than aware of, um, along with the increasingly complica complicated nature of the stories that um, these projects are looking at. Um, requires necessity, um, specialized skills as well as supplemental human power. You just can't do it alone, can't do it alone anymore. Um, and finally, a, an increased desire for impact or stated differently, um, less, of an, less, of, less patience for no impact. Um, so the, the, you know, pouring all these resources, all this time into a project, you know, uncovering malfeasance, corruption, human rights abuses, and then, and then seeing that project not have the impact that one would like, I think that this is one of the other main, main drivers of um, this trend. So again, just uh, directing you to the website and I'm going to hand it back over to Elisa. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Sarah. Um, so Pankaj, I know that uh, you have talked about how working with civil society gave you insight into some new business models for journalists. Can you talk a little bit about your what your experience has been like as a journalist partnering with civil society? Yeah, thank you so much. Thrilled to be here. Um, my first uh, like attraction was uh, the domain expertise itself, because a lot of time as journalists, when we are focusing on a topic, uh, we don't know everything about it. Uh, and when at Factor Daily, we decided to focus on fewer uh, story projects, the challenge for us was to kind of gain deeper domain expertise. So for example, electronic waste is one of the first topics that we picked and uh, we didn't know much. Our understanding was very cosmetic. So uh, that was the first driver for me uh, to partner, engage and, and kind of, you know, really uh, sit down with civil society in this case. Uh, and uh, as we uh, kept going forward, um, new things kept emerging. Uh, you know, there were challenges. Uh, the, the, the biggest challenge was, uh, to be honest, uh, keep making sure that uh, the journalistic uh, lens is intact. Uh, and, and everything we are being told, we are being shown, uh, we are hearing, uh, we, we are, we are, uh, we are uh, ensuring that uh, we, are, we are dealing it with the journalistic lens. Uh, because civil society can also uh, have uh, its, its agenda uh, many times. And uh, while we may have a common purpose in terms of creating more awareness and uh, getting some action on the ground, 
uh, our tools are different, our processes are different. So, so that that was the biggest challenge. The 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 the, the very refreshing discoveries and realizations happen on the business model side, like you mentioned. And uh, we started looking at co-creating uh, deep stories. And one of the stories on electronic base, we signed up an OTT uh, for a production deal. And what I'm now realizing is that going forward in this deal itself, uh, civil society is a great partner uh, because uh, not only in terms of resourcing uh, the story into multiple formats, uh, and, and we are changing that format to create societal impact because mainstream content uh, helps create that kind of an impact. Uh, so, so, so we are now realizing uh, that it's, it's a very strong pillar. Uh, and as uh, it shapes into uh, one of the sustainable uh, revenue streams for us as a nonprofit newsroom, uh, we are beginning to look at this uh, very seriously and we are creating our own playbook, uh, which hopefully we will apply in other such engagements. Great, thank you. Um, and Moton Rayo, one of the things that, um, that we have talked about is, you know, the way that you want journal, you, the way that you think that journalists should be changing their relationships with, with sources. What are some things that you've learned during during your work on this topic? Um, thank you very much. Um, first, to congratulate Sarah and uh, the team for the great work on the research. Um, it's really exciting to see um, a lot of work that has gone into that, and um, the findings of, of the research are equally exciting. And um, for us, um, as a student of political science, because I, I read political science, it was clear to me that um, there needed to be a relationship between civil society and, and journalism. And also um, the struggles of my country, Nigeria, from colonialism to military rule, um, really gave you know, that background of a need for activist group, civil society groups to collaborate with the media to push the front. Uh, what, I saw what was missing was that after we got a more sustainable democracy, um, the work around intentionally, you know, now collaborating for the kind of country we wanted, we saw that there was a need to improve that. Uh, we also saw that there were gaps in the understanding of, um, you know, what non-governmental organizations expect the media to be doing because of the kinds of collaboration that has gone on in the past and what the media actually should be doing. And so um, I'll talk from the perspective of a model that really relates to Sarah's um, amazing work that I've built over 10 years, which is called Rush, Report Until Something Happens. And it's basically built on what really should be happening. Um, like Pankaj said, we're talking about uh, a huge knowledge gap on the side of the media, of journalists. There's a massive knowledge gap. We want to cover stories, but we are not always, our expertise is journalism. And then there are people who are experts in the field that we want to cover, experts in education, experts in medicine, experts in you know, the extractives. And it is then important that we bridge our knowledge gap so that we can do our work of informing the populace, educating the populace, and also entertaining the populace properly because now we know. And, and so that, that knowledge gap is there, the knowledge gap of the subject matter. And of course, we're also thinking of issues of distribution. Now, uh, we might publish as just a media house, but when it gets to the hand of um, an NGO, an advocacy group, for instance, they can take it to the streets, they can take it to communities, they can get people talking about it. When it gets to the end of the entertainment industry, they can write a song about it. They can do a play about it. And so the information that we wish to pass can spread wider and faster because we are collaborating. And of course, there's the issue of ownership. Um, we want the, because journalists don't report for themselves, we report issues. We report because uh, we believe that reporting, yes, it informs people, but it also educates them to be able to, um, to be able to participate better and in many countries, civic participation is actually what expands that space for, for development. Um, so the 
supply of good governance is a function of the demand for it. And in many countries where there is apathy and where people do not want to participate, it is also a function of what they know. And so when journalists report these other um, groups of people who also have their own mechanisms of informing and educating can take up the report. Uh, of course, the impact part is there and it is um, an important thing. Um, for us, that impact is, um, you know, we have reported corruption, for instance, for many years, and I have supported, my organization has supported so many, you know, reports and awards to journalists doing investigative reporting. But, you know, the big numbers, some, uh, a lot of trillions of dollars stolen and uh, so many things going wrong. Sometimes the people don't understand that. Uh, but when you partner with others, you can break it down in ways people will understand so that we can activate their participation and they can own the stories. And of course, there are also legal issues. You know, when one journalist, like when we bring four or five journalists, leasing organizations like media houses to write a story or about a story uh, as an organization, one of the reasons we also do it is, is easy to sue, sue one journalist or sue a number of, of one or one media house. But when you're dealing with five media houses and six non-governmental organizations, it becomes more complicated for you to sue us, you know, for doing our work. And so the protection of journalism itself lies in its capacity to be able to, to, to collaborate. I, I'll stop there now and uh, we can go on with the discussion. Thank you. Um, actually, that was a great segue because uh, you did just mention um, talking about impact, and that was going to be my next question. So um, we'll start uh, this one with Pankaj. Um, you know, I think one of the things that was super interesting in the report was the way that different people kind of viewed collecting, uh, tracking impact, especially the difference between journalism and civil society. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, um, what are some lessons learned from tracking impact or trying to track impact across collaborative projects like this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so one of the things I, I want to make sure I, I, I put out is that I'm not a big believer in numbers and data. And, um, and I, in just a couple of lines, I'm saying that because I think it blinds us. Uh, and whether we talk of advertising or subscription, uh, or, you know, it blinds us because we start feeding uh, to agendas and, and our metrics are, okay, so this is working, so let's do more of this. Uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is that the sense of purpose uh, in, in at least the nonprofit media is very, very important. And uh, once we start looking at metrics uh, in terms of numbers, uh, purely for measuring impact, it can be blinding. And that's my uh, opinion. But then, uh, does it mean that uh, we have we are ourselves blind in terms of knowing if we are being impactful or not? Uh, you know, so so there, I, I think the, the first purpose of nonprofit journalism is sense making, uh, and and which is why we are talking about this collaboration with civil society. Uh, no matter what we keep telling, if it is not being understood. Uh, no matter what format uh, we are producing stuff, no matter how interactive the story is, no matter how self-fulfilling it is, if it is not translating into understanding, uh, then it is of no use. So for me, uh, and this is the reason why I think of sense-making as the biggest uh, measure, you know, me me measurement when it comes to understanding impact. Uh, and how do we do that? Uh, if when we start, and, and Mutan Rai was making that point, and, and it is fascinating the way she's talking about how a story could become a song, a, a, a drama, a street play, uh, anything, any vehicle on which the idea uh, can ride to reach more people and to achieve this goal of sense making. For me, that's a measure of impact, which is why, for us at least, when, when I'm talking about uh, you know, looking at stories as products uh, that could become different things. If it becomes an OTT, uh, a series that we are working on, for example, now, uh, it's, it's a great impact for me because I'm reaching <clears throat> different languages. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm also uh, looking beyond English language uh, because a lot of topics that we are talking about, uh, you know, people who, who are not on the so-called English internet could gain immensely from 
but great content is not reaching them. So if we partner with the content creators, OTT and production houses, we can do that. So for us, uh, how many stories are becoming mainstream content? Uh, how many of them are actually reaching to the grassroots uh, in a way that they are understood? Uh, so I know it is a little deviation from just targeting the policymakers, think tanks, you know, all those intellectual discussions that keep happening on all the topics from climate change to uh, electronic waste, right? Uh, but for me, uh, I, I prefer being niche. I prefer creating impact, even if it's a small, but where it matters the most. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Sarah, go ahead. I just wanted to comment on how much I love that because um, it's something that we don't we didn't talk about explicitly, but it's is was like the concept of the fact that advocacy can look very different in different contexts, right? Like, I think when a lot of people think about advocacy, they think of like you know, you know, going up to the steps of government and presenting a petition, or you know, like advocating for um, someone to have you know some sort of consequence on some sort of official or business or something, but actually advocacy can look very different. It can look like storytelling to an audience that would not normally see the story through, you know, some sort of, uh, through a video, you know, through a movie or something like that. So I, I just wanted to say, I really love that point. And it sort of broadens the definition of advocacy in a way that I think is useful as well. Yeah, if I can jump in. So, so, so totally, um, like I said, it's it's an exciting session for me. I'm really excited about it because what we are talking about is on audience engagement. And you know, it is at the center of what can actually cause change. Um, like Pankaj, I talk about something I call beyond numbers. So we can have all the statistics, but where are we getting with them? And then what does the street say? You know, sometimes, you know, a bureau of statistics will reel out numbers and I'm like, this is different from what we see on the street. And there has to be a way to merge this, you know, big numbers with what is happening on the street, because that is where impacts can happen. That is where change can happen. And it has to do with the fact that, you know, there's a way that media has been constructed to be very elitist and serving to elites. And it is the very reason why there's a decline in the capacity of the media to sustain itself. Because if the people who have the mass of the people are not interested and do not understand you, then who do you sell to? If you're selling more to government and private sector, then where is the place of the independence of the media? Where, when these are the people who pay for the work that the media does. So collaborating is actually at the heart of the sustainability that media wants to achieve and the independence that it wants to achieve because it gives it the power, you know, that's why it's the mass media, the mass media, but somehow it has become the elite media, the media for, you know, just the sophisticated and the English speaking. And, you know, there's a type of person you expect to understand media, but that's not how media work is supposed to be. It's supposed to be reaching the people, reaching the citizens. And for us in a country where, you know, and for every country, I believe, where you really need to activate citizens' participation. And the way to do that is to ensure that, you know, they understand what they are reading, it gets to them and they can participate because they know. Absolutely. And I think that all three of you kind of touched on another major issue that came up in the report a lot, which was that tension between journalism and advocacy and how you can kind of straddle that line. And, you know, it does bring up some interesting ethical issues for journalists, I think, but it is something that, as Sarah mentioned, the as the definition of advocacy is changing, that's something that a lot of journalists are beginning to reckon with. So, Sarah, did you want to um, maybe talk a little bit about that tension and then um, anyone else can jump in as well? Sure. Yes, absolutely. I, I also wanted to um, sort of mention uh, in response to Mochin Rayo's point, too, like this this uh, this impact that you're talking about with uh, community engagement and understanding is also the most difficult to track. Right. If you're a journalism organization and this is your goal, this is your ultimate impact goal. Uh, it's much more difficult to track than, you know, online metrics of the kind that uh, Pankaj was just talking about, right? So um, I think that this is where, well, this is where we still have work to do as, um, 
you know, people who think about these things, right, is how, you know, how do we programmatically or sort of with less friction um, sort of quantify that? Because at the in the end, you know, a lot of funders want to see that that kind of impact was made. So it's, it's kind of a, still something that I think is being worked out. Um, but yes, the, the tension between, um, between, you know, sort of neutrality or objectivity and advocacy is real. Um, and it, 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 in, in our, in the people we interviewed, um, it was more real for those journalists who had, you know, trained in objectivity, you know, who sort of schooled, um, in that tradition. And there was a real discomfort bordering on, um, anxiety about partnering with civil society organizations. However, importantly, um, those journalists were not any less likely to join a cross field collaboration. They were just more anxious about it. So um, we did see, you know, we sort of in the in the report, we sort of compared the global north to the global south. And those are not sort of ideal categories in any way, but we kind of um, saw this pattern and we saw that for journalists who, you know, really wanted to remain neutral with as, you know, as so many do. Um, they found ways to work around it. And so we talk about, again, in detail, but but here I'll just say, um, you know, very specific practices, which, um, you know, Pankaj and Milton Rayo can speak to with more detail, but, but um, such as, you know, being very transparent, whose role is which, and laying it out at the beginning of the project, you know, making very clear, okay, we're going to do, you know, this explainer part, and then, you know, maybe on the, on the website, there will be like a separate piece. And, um, you know, or maybe the advocacy organization or the civil society organization will pick it up with the advocacy element later and that sort of thing. So um, there were practices. And then there are also um, people at journalism organizations like Miriam Wells at Bureau at uh, Bureau for Investigative Journalism in England, who um, talked very sort of um, openly and um, I was going to say like sort of advocates. Uh, but, you know, it sort of pushes the, the narrative, pushes the narrative boundary of what journalists uh, are able to, like, care about in a way, right? So she's like, it would be sort of almost ridiculous to say, and I'm paraphrasing here, this is not, these are not her words, to say that we don't care about human rights, right? To say that we don't care about justice. And sort of almost saying, like, let's be a little bit more honest about things we you know, sort of these small d democratic values that I think so many of the investigative journalists working on projects like this care about. Um, but I would love to hear more from the people actually practicing. Motsun Rakio, you want to go ahead? Okay. Yes, I, I, can, I can go ahead. So um, to my mind, the work of the journalists is clear and the work of other parts of civil society are clear. And that is why in the Rush model, I, I explained that uh, it is important, like Sarah says, that when a collaboration is happening, that from the beginning, we are clear about who is doing what and what we can do and what we cannot do. So to my mind, for instance, the work can start as a story. So an already published story about supplies in the hospital, for instance. A civil society organization picks that up and goes to that community. So I talk on the rush about two major communities. There's a community of interest and there's a community of geography. And I say that where they intersect, um, the niche that Pankaj mentioned is where impacts will be highest. So the journalist does reporting. And I always say that the journalist can be friend to many, but the journalist cannot be in bed with any. So even the advocacy groups, we can't. That is not what we do. We're journalists so that even if an advocacy group as if there's something that we need to report and about an advocacy group that we've collaborated with, it is our work. It is not witch hunting. It is just, you know, putting news out and seeking justice. But journalism is not a, a totally objective profession. It is biased to truth. It is biased to justice. It is biased to human rights. So those are clear as to what we do. Journalism has some advocacy in it, but no, it does not equal advocacy. So uh, when we're organizing programs and we are more of a journalism training and capacity development organization, we don't publish directly, but we support many organizations that do. But I always say that, you know, our organization is not unlikely to lead, you know, a placard carrying protest 
about something. The way that we protest is to report about the issues or support journalists to report about the issues. But there are some people whose work it is to go to the communities to mobilize people. That is not our work. So I think that definitely there's a tension, but the more we educate and enlighten and, you know, talk about the fact that, you know, our roles are complementary, but we are not equal to one another, the, the better and, you know, the better for, for us. Um, there's also the thing about tracking in what we have found is that uh, one of the things that people say when I talk about rush people say ah, about fatigue you know because rush is also about follow-up journalism we've reported an issue we want to keep on it until the people feel changed well quickly make an example of you know reporting the extractives for instance in the Niger Delta and I think I shared the story with Sarah to say, you know, journalists have been reporting the Niger Delta for many years. And we're now finding situations where the Niger Delta of Nigeria is the region where there is oil, where, you know, most of the resources come from. And so there's a lot of pollution in the area, oil spillage, um, a lot of, um, it has affected the livelihood of the people and the people have not been better off, you know, like the story of the blessing and the cost of, you know, having resources and having crude oil, especially. But, you know, people have been reporting it. And now when we send journalists to the field to report, we get feedback to say, you know, the people are asking us to buy them breakfast. They're asking us to pay them before they talk. And we're asking, why are you asking for this? And they are saying, you know, journalists, you've been coming to this environment for 30 years our lives have not changed, we're still the same. So please buy me breakfast so that when I, when I, you don't do anything about this again, I remember that I ate breakfast. I remember that oh, I was given some money because this has no benefit to me. So how we, do we then, how do you keep reporting when the people's lives do not change, when the people cannot see movement? So we say, yes, we have to keep following up on the issue, keep reporting it, but also we have to be able to say, on this particular project, or on this particular things, and we have a lot of abandoned projects in the country, on this particular issue that we're pushing, we have been able to record success. So an example, a community in, uh, in Northern Nigeria that had not had power for many years, a journalist we supported wrote the story, and then the advocacy group picked up the story. So we really believe in the need for an independent driver in collaborations between journalists and other groups, you know? And so we are the independent driver. They picked up the story and a community that had not had power supply for over six years, they get power supply. That is impact. And that is how we track it. It is that issue. And we can talk about who collaborated on it. Where is the story? Where is the community now? So those kind of niche kind of successes that you can talk about young people, because of a song that started as a story, the side to say, oh, we are going to get voters registered and we're going to do more. All of these kind of things, you know, there are ways that we can begin to track impact. Thank you. That is, those are some really excellent examples. Um, and I mean, it can be hard to hear sometimes, but really good points. Um, Pankaj, did you want to uh, add anything? Yeah, no, very quickly, a couple of points uh, I want to touch upon. One of them uh, involved a large, you know, the, the tussle, uh, the tension. Uh, I would say I love that tension. Uh, just imagine what all media has gone through, uh, you know, uh, brands, advertisers, subscribers, bulk subscribers, you know, all kinds of influences have been dogging us for decades. And we've been fighting all those battles. I would say this is, this is, a, this is a good battle to fight. And, and, and for that, I would look at it as a healthy tension. Uh, and I would rather have this tension than mindless uh, tension with brands and advertisers and subscribers, which actually takes me away from my core purpose. So, so that's number one. The second thing I want, I want to make an observation about uh, you know, scale, impact, mainstream media, and so on. So again, I'm talking from my experience. So my context is India. Uh, my context uh, are social, uh, digital, internet intersections that I see here. Uh, so first of all, I, I, I now believe that individual creators in the social space from YouTubes and all other platforms are beginning to emerge as great potential partner for media. And I'm saying that because 
number one, uh, the, the, a lot, at least some of them are very focused on a particular topic or a cause. And, and that helps engage with such partners because unlike mass media, which is fighting its own existential battles on one hand, and you know, there is a race to the bottom with, with the, the daily news, these folks, individual creators, are very sharp in terms of their positioning. And I think, again, going back to the impact question, uh, these individual creators are platforms in themselves. They have few million and, and tens of millions of followers and uh, subscribers. So I think the elephant in the room is this. And, and, and if we need to brutally focus, uh, or bluntly focus on impact, then we need to engage with these new age partners. And we have started doing that and some very encouraging results. Uh, when we did a series of stories uh, on CSAM, uh, the sex, uh, child sexual abuse material online, uh, we partnered with a bunch of creators who cared for that topic. And, and we got more engagement from, from those individual creators than uh, a traditional media. So I think we also need to change the, 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 the playground a little in, in that sense. And, 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 and I think that itself is a massive opportunity, at least in a country like India. Uh, I, the, the influence of these creators uh, that they have across different languages, the reach that they have, uh, phenomenal. And, and a lot of them are looking to do good as well, because most of them are seen as uh, superficial, uh, you know, uh, mostly uh, fashion gurus or things like that. And there is a craving inside some of them, at least I have discovered while talking to them, that they want to be doing good. They want to be standing with the good. And good journalism is a great uh, bridge uh, for them. So, I think we, we, we just need to look beyond. I think we are too consumed in what uh, has, we have been carrying over the decades. Uh, if you allow me, Aliza, to just add something to that. So really, um, from what Panka just said, really, the, even the media has, you know, these groups already. And that, that, that's what I've been um, paying attention to in the last couple of years. The fact that, you know, the media has what it called beats. So there's somebody who reports health. There are people who report education. There are people who report security. And, and that is the community I talk about, the community of interest. The same way there is, um, in as much as you know, we say the influencers and sometimes in the media circle, we call them with some disdain, like they've come to take our work and they are not journalists. Yes, they are not journalists, but they have their role in society. You know, So there's somebody who is a musician, influencer, who loves education, you know? So there is that niche that can, that collaboration that can happen because you're a reporter, you love education. There is a singer who, love, who, is, who is passionate about education. There, is a, there are many non-governmental organizations who are passionate about education, you know? There are you know, other groups like that, community groups, parents, teachers, associations, passionate about education. And I'm just, it's just saying that when they are able to collaborate, then they are going to make impact. And you are going to be telling them to do what they're interested in already anyway. And it's not necessarily always the media goes to them. Sometimes these people come to the media to say that, you know, you have reported this issue for long. Can we, can we help you do a debate in a secondary school about it? Because that is what we do. We organize debate and see how we will generate interest from, from students. So even in the media, there's the capacity to already break down into different groups and different interests and use that as a way to collaborate. But what I am also saying is that when you then go to in geographies, when you go to geographies, and we're talking about education in a particular community, the tendency that the passion will even be higher because this is their environment, their children are going to that school, and you know the government, the local government or the regional government at that area is more reachable than the federal government. So the capacity of that collaboration to happen at that level and to get moment to gain momentum is even higher because people are now closer knit and they are very interested in the issues. 
Thank you. Um, I'll just let everyone know that um, I have, um, I'm going to ask another question now. And then after that, I'll leave some time for audience questions. So if you do have any, please go ahead and put them into the Q&A box or into the chat box, and I will get to those momentarily. Um, but in the meantime, my last question, um, and you know, I think all three of you have talked a little bit about this to some extent, but it's clear that in some cases the journalists are approaching civil society and in other cases civil society is approaching the journalists. So there's obviously, this is obviously a situation in which both sides understand what can be gained by having this type of collaboration. But I guess I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, what are some general best practices? Do you feel that you want to have like a formal agreement in place? Do you feel like it's more of a handshake situation? And, you know, is there, what are kind of some of the roles and responsibilities that are laid out beforehand? So in other words, what are, what are the best practices for forming this kinds of collaboration? And Pankaj, I'll go ahead and start with you for this question. Um. I'm sure Sarah will have a much better playbook because mine is a work in progress. You know, I have mostly field notes to share. I think clearly, uh, uh, you know, articulating the purpose uh, always helps. So in our case, for example, uh, when we reached out, we told them very clearly that before we get to the story, we need to understand, would you be able to spend time with us over the next few weeks uh, in, in workshops or whatever it takes uh, to take us through this topic, uh, both for uh, child sexual abuse material and electronic waste, we, we did this model. So that was the first thing we told them. They said, happy to do that. Uh, we didn't even discuss any story until then. Uh, after spending around a month, uh, we came back, had our internal discussions, we thrashed it out, and we came up with the idea of the story project. And, and, and that's the time we went back to them again and said, hey, now this is turning out to be something, a topic that we want to focus for the long term. This is what we would need from you. Uh, we will attribute uh, you on our site and story project as a partner, a, a collab, you know, collaboration between us in, in terms of sense making around this topic. Uh, there is no, uh, we don't expect any monies and we won't give you any money. Uh, and we were very upfront in, in saying that. We also told them that uh, if this becomes potentially something, uh, let's say we sign a production deal or something, uh, uh, what would you, and we were very open about it, uh, what would you like? Uh, and uh, in both the cases, uh, they said, uh, that is your effort. Uh, and uh, for us, uh, the thing uh, would be awareness. And as long as you're attributing us, uh, we are cool with that. Uh, and then finally, we also told them that uh, this will be a journalistic work. Uh, so every, every, while we will rely on you for insights and understanding, uh, we have our own journalistic independence uh, and scrutiny. Uh, and uh, would that be fine with you? And they said, yes, absolutely. So this is a very broad, we didn't have a contract in place, but in future, uh, I do see encountering all kinds of uh, uh, folks and organizations where they can ask me, hey, what's the upside? If, you, if this becomes a movie or a book, uh, what is in it for us? Uh, I don't have a specific answer, but I would just throw things like if, I mean, this is a nonprofit media, we are a nonprofit media. Uh, if there is an IP, then yeah, I mean, why not share uh, the any outcomes from that IP with you towards the effort? Because now I have learned that in production, there are different stages. Uh, and when a story, a project goes to production, there is a cost of production, or there's a cost of uh, research and development of a, a project, a movie project. Now, uh, that R&D uh, budget is where you can allocate uh, contribution uh, to researchers, uh, so so civil society uh, can be uh, you know a research contribution, and you we can value their time in in that sense. But absolutely journalistic. Oh, just just real quick, Pankaj, when we first talked, am I remembering correctly that you also did a a lot of research on which civil society organization you would partner with? Like you researched them for a long time first too, right? <laughs> Yes, we did. And, yes. and it's very important <laughs> that you bring it up because uh, color of money and color of insights is very important in journalism. 
And for us, uh, we didn't, because again, these are long-term collaborations. Uh, you can't abort uh, once you are in flight. So, so as you would do with any partner or when you are hiring a reporter, uh, I would say that uh, there is nothing wrong in looking at everything through the same lens in terms of integrity, uh, the sense of purpose and how it is aligned with uh, our purpose. Uh, and absolutely not questioning or judging them for their advocacy because it's their job. But the intersection of work that we have with them, that needs to be very diligently uh, you know, checked. Thank you. Um, Sarah, did you want to add anything else in addition to that question? Oh, no, just no, not at all. I just, I, I, no, I just, I, I remember you saying that and you said we, we applied the same investigative skills that we would to in a story to figure out which, which partner to work with, which I thought was really interesting and stuck out in my mind. I didn't know if Motion Rayo had any thoughts on that either. Um, yes, quickly. So we, we actually write uh, proposals that are built for collaborative journalism. And so we budget for meetings. And at those meetings, we actually choose a subject matter. So we have done on electricity before, we have done on the education before, and we bring together investigative reporters, organizations, representatives of organizations who will participate. We'd also bring um, non-governmental organization, uh, advocacy group or media organizations that do things like uh, shows or discussion shows and all that, we bring them together and we write them to tell them this is a collaborative work and these are your roles in the work. So we do a meeting, it's residential, we pay the bill for them to come together and then we discuss the story together. Uh, the civil society groups that we bring together, they also have a lot of knowledge of the issue. So they share the knowledge. Sometimes we do wide stakeholders meeting, all day meetings where we bring like 16, 20 civil society people, government, private sector people together, just talking about issues. And we tell journalists to just listen because journalists are used to, you know, just rush into the news and saying, we know, but a lot of times we don't know. So we say, just listen so that you can write nuanced stories. And then we support the story, investigative stories and the various organizations will actually, um, they, will, um, they will publish across their different platforms. So sometimes we choose dates. For instance, the electricity one, we chose the, 1st of October, which was the 60th anniversary of Nigeria's independence. And we were talking about living in darkness for 60 years. And so we published first on that day, we had a calendar for publishing and each organization published their parts, but all organizations co-published. And then, you know, the advocacy group picked it from there and started talking about it on social media, in communities and all of that. And then we pay, you know, we pay also and we, emphasize that you know they don't become your peer the media doesn't become your peer because you met at this meeting and you've worked together but of course there's a relationship that builds and when there are things that people can do together many of the friendships last longer than the collaboration but i also suggest that we keep it within a particular time and a particular project because people have many other things that they are doing and even the media has you know the daily breaking news that it has to do so you don't want to get people tired and, and get them fatigued. And just really quickly, I know I'm sure there are questions that Eliza wants to get to, but that gets to the issue of trust as well, what you just mentioned about the friendships. And we heard this from a lot of our interviews as well. Like it, it is so useful and beneficial to build up relationships where you trust the partner, they trust you, and you don't have to go through all that groundwork every time you wanna to work together, right? There doesn't have to be this, this whole sort of pre-reporting period where you all have to get to know each other and all this sort of thing when you, trust an organization, you know they're going to bring you quality information, and they know that you're going to report it fairly and accurately, then that really helps facilitate the process for the next project, right? Yes, totally. And for us, because we don't publish, um, we get the trust of other media organizations to call them in the room to say, let's do this together. Um, so we are not publishing, so we're like a mediator. Excellent. Um, we have um, one or two questions from the audience here. So Jackie R from Minneapolis um, is talking about um, some experience that she has at the City Bureau Documenters Network. Um, she says, I've been really curious about how we can advocate for greater government transparency without crossing a line. For example, we'd like to see the city live stream its meetings, a service it used to offer, 
but I'm concerned about taking specific policy stances in terms of how they figure out how to do that. Um, is there anyone who would like to address that? Sarah. Uh, well, I can just, I can just uh, sort of maybe to broaden it out slightly um, and just say, I'm sorry, can you put the question back up? <laughs> or repeat it, thanks. Uh, the question of how do you partner without becoming advocates if they say something that is an advocate, if they, if they take a position on something, I think is the general question, right? Um, so, so this idea of, and this is, I think something that you both talked about, but, um, it seems to me based on what, um, you know, what these partnerships end up looking like, um, yeah, so, so basically, right, what, what the, I think, you know, as we've said here already today, like the role of the journalist is very clear. It's very easy to say, it, it would be, it would be a fairly neutral request to say, you know, can you please make this be more transparent, right? Just, just make, just make the information more widely available. Like, I don't, I think that that's a pretty non-controversial stance for a newsroom to take very much in line with, um, you know, sort of the tradition of neutrality and that sort of thing. Although, right. I mean, in various places around the world and in various contexts, you know, simply just even putting the information out there, um, is, is sort of is political. And, and I think that this is why I was going to say when you asked earlier, you know, what do the um, agreements look like or best practices look like, you know, it, it really does vary. I mean, it, it is, it's so useful to be able to generalize and, um, you know, it turns out that a lot of the practices are the same or sort of take on the same flavor, but, um, you know, it really does vary, you know, situation to situation. And, you know, if you have a context in which um, even just making information public is a political stance, like a dangerous stance, then that's, you know, very different from from another. I don't know if anyone else wanted to add to that. Yeah, I, 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 well, I don't have all the social uh, political context of where this question has come from, but uh, I, I was just thinking about it. Uh, so number one, clearly the best advocacy for journalism is to do journalism, you know, and that's about it. Uh, nothing beyond that. But in this case, I, I was actually wondering that there are a lot of roles uh, like audience editor or communities editor and, and, and so on. Uh, I, I, I feel that some of these questions are better tackled through these roles, uh, even if they're part of a larger media or a smaller news newsroom, if, if there is a role like that, those folks are more equipped to tackle uh, and, and, and I think they, they have more, not freedom, but they will have more ways of uh, uh, finding a path for, for questions like these. And they will be within their rights to do because they are not uh, journalists in that sense. Uh, their, their job is to ensure community engagement or audience engagement. So they would look at this question very differently from the way a reporter should look at it. Thank you. Um, we do have a hard stop at 1 p.m. Uh, DC time, so I'll just um, have uh, one final question here. Um, we've gotten a couple questions from journalists in, I see Pakistan, Burundi, and I think I saw it somewhere else talking about closed or closing spaces. So, you know, if there is any sort of insight that any of the three of you wanted to add about, you know, how these kinds of collaborations can take place in slightly more difficult operating environments, any, anything that, and that open question to the panel, anyone who wants to jump in there. Okay, allow me to um, jump in from yeah. uh, some experience. So um, one of the um, things that we try to support is cartooning, for instance, editorial cartooning. And we found um, through the history of the country and um, up till now that, you know, there are one group of journalists. In fact, um, there's debate sometimes that are the journalists, are the artists, but th there are many uh, editorial departments in journalism in, in media houses and they are journalists. We acknowledge them as journalists. We give awards, investigative journalism award to cartoonists. And we've found that it is more difficult to litigate on cartoons for instance. So we've, we've collaborated on um, freedom of expression with cartoonists before, and we, we did a, a book called Drawing the Line 
of um, freedom of expression. And then they were just a collection of cartoons. You know, they're using caricature. How do you say it's you? You know, how do you, we're not using exact name. How, how do you insist that we're talking about you? So we found, and I, I don't know if that is useful to this person. We found um, cartooning, for instance, a very strong tool for closed environments because, and you can also collaborate with people outside your society doing that and talking more about it. Um, technology gives us a lot of leverage that we can you know, use to go across borders to also collaborate on this. So if cartoonists from another climb or even your country are talking more about the issue, you know, in certain, the people will get talking about it anyway. And that is what we want. Um, people interested so much that the leaders need to be interested. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone else want to add to that? Okay, well, in that case, I will say, um, I will say thank you to everyone. Um, thank you to the participants and attendees for your questions and for your comments. Thank you to our panelists to Sarah, to Pankaj, and to Motunrayu for a really excellent and interesting discussion today. Um, it was really wonderful having this, uh, having this panel with you, and I look forward to many more productive discussions on this topic in the future. Thank you so much for having us and for everyone who watched. This was great. And Thank you so much. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.